the elects, every instinct of body and mind alike, howled with alarm, cried out for flight. It took a determined effort to hold her gaze upon the abomination before her. She had come here, climbing up through the keep of high fires, in answer to a call only one closely attuned to the share could have sense. It was the call of sudden change, of the sun bursting in with brilliant light as the shutter is pulled back. Alone in a narrow corridor, she had staggered, would have fallen had she not reached out and pressed her hand to the dank wall. And then, shivering, she had tipped her head back and gazed up at the ceiling. But it was not black stone that she saw, and not with eyes that she looked. Down, down through the walls and the gutters and the passageways of high fast, power was pouring. A dark, malignant torrent of delirious potency cascaded through the share, and she knew without question from whence it came. So she had climbed, heavy legged and fearful, hoping that someone else might join her before she reached her destination, someone to share the burden of witnessing whatever awaited her, and hoping at the same time that no one else would come, for she was the elect, and the Nakarim of High Pass were her charge, and she must guard them against this. At the door of the dreamer's chamber, she had hesitated. It had taken every fragment of will she could muster to force herself to open that door and step inside. It was not time, not the man she had viewed with affectionate concern for all these years. It had his form, it was made of his stuff, but it was not him. The fact that this cadaverous figure moved and spoke gave it the semblance of life and familiarity. But they signified little more than the riding of maggots beneath the hide of a dead cow. The maggots did not give the cow life. This was not the dreamer awoken. Aegis wore a timed body like a cloak. I don't like this skin, the abomination slurred, holding up a gaunt hand and staring at it. Set it aside then, said Ceres. Remove yourself. Return to your own skin, your proper place. Time grimaced, his gums were white, those teeth that remained jaundiced. What do you think that would achieve? He is gone, one who inhabited this shell. Gone utterly, his mind a frail thing, almost wasted away. I cut it free, I watched it melt into the chair. You should not warn it, there was almost nothing left of it, even before I came. Ceris closed her eyes, she gripped the iron chain around her neck with one hand. She had no way to tell whether Aegis spoke the truth. If she could have reached out into the share with her mind, perhaps she might have caught some hint of time's presence, and thus discovered whether or not he persisted on hope. But she no longer dared to let her awareness extend into even the shallowest fringes of the share. Such was the turbulence, the turmoil surrounding Aegis, that she knew she would be unable to hold on to any sense of herself. Already her head spun and she had to fight back waves of nausea. Don't close those lovely eyes, lady. You should look upon me, look upon this, in wonder. I thought you were all scholars here, aren't you? Here is something you've never seen before. When she looked upon him, it was with all the contempt she could muster. You think yourself clever, do you, she spat. I don't think clever is quite the word for it. No, not clever. I don't have the words that would fit this. But come, let's not be cruel. The blanched head rocked on its flimsy neck. The mouth sagged open, giving out a faint groan. Ceres felt the tumult in her mind recede a fraction. The thoughts were no longer buffeted quite so viciously this way and that. It was as if Aegis had sucked back into himself some small portion of whatever poison it was that leaked out from him into the share. The effort it took was evident from the tremors that shook Time's shoulders. He barely controls this, the elect thought. It is too much for him. You are uninvited, she said. I did not invite you into this place any more than Time invited you into his body. You should thank me for the mercy I've shown you. Have you heard of the healer's blade? Every healer who travels with the Black Road Army carries one to end the suffering of those whose wounds cannot be healed. This old man was no different. I cut him loose from this rotting shell. It was only an anchor holding him back. He'd long ago surrendered himself to the chair. I will hold no debates with one who steals the bodies of others, Suris said, and turned on her heel. The door was only a few paces away. She 
felt an urgent need to put its solid oak between her and this obscenity. You will not turn your back on me, cried Amos from Tyne's throat. You will not. The words that were ragged, but the fury that informed them was real, and it burned not only in that voice, in the share that was a howling storm of iron. The world lurked sideways beneath the elect's feet, or was it she who veered and swayed? A wind blew through her mind so loud and hard that it snatched away her thoughts and sent them swirling off into nothingness. The door for which she reached, the wooden peg that would lift its latch, receded, rushing away into the distance. The floor snapped up and crashed against her knees, then twisted itself, slammed against her head. The world had turned itself on its side. The bottom of the door stood vertically before her eyes. In the narrow gap between door and flagstone flooring, she saw the warm glow shed by some torch out on the passageway beyond. It looked safe, comforting, and immensely distant. Someone was whispering in her ear, don't turn your back on me. This is a sanctuary, isn't it? For my kind, for all our kind, that's what I've heard. You can't cast me out, never again. Billowing white cloth, the hem of time's gown, brushed over her face. Naked, near-skeletal feet were walking away from her. She heard the creak of the door on its ancient hinges, and then it was closing, and the hunched, frail figure had passed out into the passages of bypass. <laughs>